I'm going to make a change. Am I supposed to go back in? For once in my life, it's going to feel real good. Going to make a difference, going to make it right. As I turn up the collar on my favorite winter coat, the wind is blowing my mind. I see kids on the street without enough to eat. Who am I to be blind, pretending not to see their needs? A summer's disregard, a broken bottle top, and one man's soul. They follow each other on the wind, you know, because they got nowhere to go. I've been a victim of a selfish kind of love. It's time that I realize there are some with no home, not a nickel to loan. Could it really be me pretending that they're not alone? A will are deeply scarred, somebody's broken heart, and a washed out dream. They follow the pattern of wind you see, because they got no place to be. That's why I'm starting with me. You got to get it right while you got the time. Because when you close your heart, then you close your mind. Just lift yourself. You know, you've got to stop it yourself. Make that change. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. And no message could be any clearer. Because the reality is, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make that change. The group of seven, I'm honored by your presence as I'm installed as chair of the American Association. Thank you. Thank you. Now that everyone has taken their seats, my first act as chair is to acknowledge each of you for the great work that you do each and every day. So please, consider this a one-man standing ovation. It is with a spirit of humility that I accept the honor to be your chair of the American Association of Homes and Services for the Aging. You know, I stand here because over the last 32 years, and it's true, I started when I was five. <laughs> all right, all right, 10. I've been afforded opportunities. There was Dick Ice in the American Baptist Homes of the West family, who not only offered me a job, but provided tuition reimbursement. Then there was Carol Galante in the Bridge Housing family that offered me opportunities. There was Barbara Hood and Burns Johnson in the Aging Service of California family, my friends and colleagues, that allowed me to participate on the board, become treasurer. They've mentored me, they've nurtured me, they supported and encouraged me. And then there's Mary Alice Ryan, who much to my surprise, invited me to participate on the executive search committee, where we selected this Southern gentleman that has a fetish with animal stories. <laughs> but I've told Larry on more than one occasion that this was his calling. And then there's Steve Proctor, who extended an invitation to me to participate in the House of Delegates. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge Don Stump, Don McQuarrie, my CCH family, that has allowed me to moonlight, yeah, so that I could take advantage of this opportunity to serve and learn from the Asa family. And there's one of my team members that's here that paid his own way just so he could be here to witness my installation. So Joe Thomas, I can't see you, but I sense your presence there. So to all of you, for the mentoring, for the encouragement, for the nurturing, I express my deepest and heartfelt gratitude. I also want to thank the gentleman that just left, Tom Slimmer, for his excellent leadership as chair over the past two years.
Now, Tom's focus was on improving ASA's internal structures and processes. These are critical aspects of any, the ongoing viability of any business organization, and they often go unnoticed. Tom, I can't see you, but you are one of our field's great advocates, and I am proud to be your colleague. And finally, let me thank the group of seven who joined me on stage earlier. They cited passages of a song that resonated with my goals as your chair. Though I am proud to serve you, I'm honored to serve you. I know that I must look at the man in the mirror and consistently change my ways to serve you and our association fully. The seven of you are all transformational leaders, and I look forward to following your footsteps. This year's conference theme, it's been stated as changing lives. Nearly 35 years ago, I had a life-changing experience with the birth of my son, John. And you have to admit, that, that guy's a little bit of a ham. I don't know where he gets it from. <laughs> but because I had loving, nurturing, and supportive parents, I wanted to give the, the same to my son. That decision changed my life, and it started me on a path that's different than the one I could have easily ended up on. I was determined that I would become someone that John could look up to. Another of life's changes occurred when a teacher suggested that my youngest daughter, Javon, repeat the grade. I shared that information, that news with my mom, and she asked me not to hold her back because it could ruin her self-confidence. So her brother, sister, and I worked all summer on reading and phonics. Today, Jervon is one of the most articulate young adults I know. After intense conversations, she sent me to the dictionary on more than one occasion. <laughs> the last changing life experience that I will share with you is with my oldest daughter, Laraja. She gave birth to a daughter, Sanaya, that was born prematurely. And God the Father provided the breath of life for only 24 hours. As we stood in the hospital, barely holding it together, Laraja looked at me with tears in her eyes, and she shared something that I'd shared with her numerous times, that God is in control. Right, Dad? So John, just by his presence, changed, refocused, and redirected my life. Javon demonstrated what dedication and commitment can do, and LaRaja displayed a level of faith and courage that to this day is unparalleled in my life. So my brothers and sisters, my Asa family, while I raised my children as a single parent, I see with crystal clear clarity that my children also raised me. So John, so John, LaRaja, and Javan, thank you for participating in our call-in days. Thank you for advocating on CAPWIS. But most importantly, thank you for changing lives, especially mine. I mentioned earlier that I had great parents, but just as my career were taking shape, they were no longer here. My dad passed away when I was 25, and my mom when I was 30. From my perspective, they were certainly gone too soon. But as LaRaja stated, God is ultimately in control. So it shouldn't be as any surprise that I'm giving back to the greater senior community what I can no longer give to mom and dad. And I see no better way to give back than to assist us as mission to create the future of aging services. For the Asa family's 5,700 members enable us to serve, to inspire, 
and to advocate in every area of senior services, from home and community-based services to skilled nursing facilities. And I know firsthand the importance of advocacy. Early in my career, I testified in Sacramento with three of my other colleagues. And we each gave passionate statements about the importance of the work that we do. And at the conclusion, I will never forget the question that was asked. It was stated and asked, if these issues are so important, why haven't I heard from my constituents? Let me say that again. After we had testified, we told our story. And the question was asked, if these issues are so important, why haven't I heard from my constituents? As we flash forward to 2004, I was asked to testify before a HUD's Appropriations Committee. And unlike my fellow panelists that walked up, sat down, read their speech, I started my testimony by acknowledging each representative with a handshake and a smile. And I think the smile got him, y'all. <laughs> so at the conclusion of my presentation, one of the representatives on the panel commended me for excellent information in presenting it with eloquence. These two examples taught me two important lessons. First, advocacy must occur at all levels, local, state, national, in all area codes, in all zip codes. And no matter what level, you must make it personal. So ASA members across the country frequently tell us that they join the association for primarily one reason, which is advocacy. But make no mistake about it, my ASA family, we must work with our association to engage in advocacy. This is not something that we can delegate even to our excellent state and national representation. And we all know that we have the best advocacy staffs nationally and statewide out of any organization. You can applaud. Is that what you want to do? We cannot delegate our advocacy responsibilities to them. Masa family, my brothers and sisters, it starts with me and it starts with you. Yes, it's true. We need to look at ourselves and make that change. I've learned that, that when the members partner with ASA and state staff on advocacy, we can do great things. And there is, no, there is no greater example of this than our work on the Community Living Assistance Services and Supports, also known as CLASS. This piece of legislation would create a national insurance program for long-term care, and it has the power to transform how you and I serve seniors. It will provide funding that will enable us to care for the elderly and those with disabilities, so enabling them to get the services they need in the place that they call home. And through our Class Act advocacy efforts, we forged new partnerships with more than 160 organizations. We've rallied ourselves around our congressional call-in days, and I know you guys are excited, and there will probably be another. All right, all right, calm down, calm down. Too much excitement in the room. <laughs> and, and through our advocacy effort, we've, we've also positioned ourselves as thought leaders and as consumer advocates. I applaud the individual and collective efforts of the Asa family, the entire Asa family, for this monumental achievement. And I'd like to highlight just a few of those that were involved. Folks like Dave Ferguson of American Baptist Homes of the West. Now Dave stepped out on faith and committed to fundraising for Class Act long before anyone knew it could be successful. 
people like Michelle Bragg of PHI for providing information and sign-in sheets at all of our nurses stations so that they could not only serve, but they could advocate as well. People like Tim Bladen from Alabama's Episcopal Place. Now this gentleman organized a call-in event for all of his residents. He hung a banner in the lobby, set up phone banks, and he even secured a local television station to cover the event. And the last example I'd like to share is people like Chris Reagan and Laverne Joseph of Retirement Housing Foundation. These people who have consistently had some of the highest numbers in the country, I guess they should because they're one of the largest organizations, but they had the highest numbers in the country for advocacy participation. And in this particular scenario, they translated all of their call-in material to multiple languages in all 100 of their, all 160 of their facilities so that each resident could communicate and participate in advocacy. We must continue, Maasa family, we must continue to enhance our advocacy and engagement efforts. We must begin to enlarge and expand and amplify our voice. We must tell our story of passion, of commitment, of service of, of humanity in service to humanity. We must create a crescendo that will be heard in all state houses and on Capitol Hill. For ASA has become a big fish, yeah, but it's an even bigger sea because ASA competes in an advocacy arena where other organizations spend billions and billions of dollars. And a lot of these players, I'm sure you know, they're special interest groups primarily concerned about one thing, financial enrichment irrespective, irrespective of the consequences to others. Now I've heard it said that the most notorious fish in the sea is the self fish. That's right, the selfish. <laughs> Some of y'all get that about three in the morning, but it's all right. <laughs> the most notorious fish in the sea is the selfish. Let not that fish be named amongst us. For the Arthur family advocates for the right policies for the right reason. Our advocacy agenda is centered around five big ideas. Quality, transition, talent, finance, and technology. I wholeheartedly believe and I'm confident that the ASA family can in fact create the future of aging services in change lives. However, to do this, we must change our advocacy outreach to include and prepare all two million of our employees from the CNA to the CEO. Workforce and that's right, come on, come on. That's what we need to do. I'll clap to that. Our workforce engagement will enlarge our voice and give employees a sense of empowerment, allowing an opportunity for them to contribute to the greater good. We must also reach out to our boards and our trustees, for they serve our organizations because they are influential community members. Our boards and trustees, we need your help, because you can help us gain access and influence in areas that we can't. We all have a need, all of us. We all have a need to feel like we are making a difference. And including a broader group of constituents will allow us to be like Verizon. With, with more networks in more places. <laughs> it said they couldn't hear me. That's what our congressional representatives are also saying. We can't hear you because we're only in certain areas, certain zip codes. We've been blessed to live in affluent communities. No, no, no. Our frontline workers are not so, they do not live in the same areas. So we're advocating in certain zip codes, but that's where we live. But that's not where our workforce lives. We need to be in every place. We need to be heard in more air codes, in more zip codes, 
by more elected leaders and ultimately by more Americans. Now, Dave Ferguson alluded to, alluded to it yesterday that we have unrecognized folks that are doing all the work. Our frontline workers, my brothers and sisters, they're the machines that run our service engines. These are the people that we've entrusted with caring for the precious gift of life. Now, now is the time to provide them an opportunity to tell the Asa family story. Enhancing our commitment to advocacy will reinforce that our missions to serve involve creating a social movement for change. That's right, a movement for change for our aging population. Each member, each member should advocate for every noble issue because a victory in one area is a victory for the entire Asa family. Now, the seven people that joined me on stage this morning who opened with the Man in the Mirror pr presentation, now they represent the full diversity of the Asa family. They represent diversity of services, of genders, of ages, of preferences, and yes, yes, cultures. We need, we need the entire family, all two million of us, to be heard on every issue. We need to hear from the Asa family on increased production of affordable housing. We need to hear from the Asa family on responsible oversight of retirement communities. We need to hear from the Asa family on realistic reimbursements for quality nursing homes. Yes, we need to hear from the Asa family about increased funding for home and community-based services. This is our continuum. This is who we are. This is what we represent. Now, during the next two years, the Asa board will meet in Washington, D.C. twice a year to ensure that our stories are told more frequently on Capitol Hill. We will begin to enhance our social media presence. That means Facebook, blogging, and Twitter. And, and let me digress here for a minute. Two years ago, somebody shared with me that they had tweeted Sharon. Well, Sharon's my girl, and I had, you tweeted her? I, excuse me? <laughs> Uh, let me tell you, I'm glad she came around the corner because I was probably about to get beat up. <laughs> so we need to enhance our social media presence. Facebook, Twitter, and blogging, and I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. You guys will be able to follow me. So that we can connect with the Asa family about advocacy issues. And finally, if I have the privilege to visit each of your great states, it is my hope that, that we will have an opportunity, that we will have an opportunity to meet, to meet with trustees and frontline workers, to share and encourage them to advocate on behalf of the people we serve. They need to be involved. So currently, also members reach out to about 40,000 legislatures a year. We make 40,000 contacts. My brothers and sisters, Sisters, members of the Asa family continuum, I challenge all of us because I believe that we can make 250,000 contacts a year. All right, some, some of y'all not applauding. Y'all don't think we could do it? I am confident that we can meet and exceed 250,000 messages a year. And this can be achieved if each of us devotes 15 minutes per week to advocacy. 15 minutes. Now, the ASA website is user-friendly. It enables you to 
contact Congress, both for you and your staff and all the issues there. All you have to do is type in your zip code, your, your name and your zip code, and all of the messages relative to ASHA issues are online. So um, we can do that. With the impending silver tsunami, change is inevitable. We all know that. Change is inevitable. I mean, we have this backlog of baby boomers. They're about to retire. I reference them as the silver tsunami because it's an age wave that's coming. Now, ASA, we have a choice. We can either be in front leading the change or we'll be forced to the back seat and be reacting to it. With our expertise, we have a mandate to create this change. We have a mandate to create the change and to help policymakers understand it. My brothers and sisters, we can create the future of aging services, and it is imperative that we begin now for the people we serve today and for the silver tsunami tomorrow. With the Asa family leading the way, America can and will be ready to honor and to serve those who have drunk longest and deepest from God's bountiful cup. And I also, as Tom did, they have seated a new board of directors. And I'd just like to acknowledge those board members. I look forward to our time together, to our journey together. And I believe, oh, they are up here. OK, praise God. So these are the new board members. <laughs> To create the future will require change to full inclusion of every voice in every service and on every issue affecting the lives of seniors. We want to live in a, in a world where policies promote seniors having choice and hope and control of their faith. When we use our voice the Asa family voice. This will be our future. So let us begin to provide opportunities. Let us be the change we want to see. So in the words of my friends, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. And I'm asking that distinguished debonair Brother, I'm saying, hey, looking good. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Let me digress. There's been a lot of eyes. There's been a lot of me's. But let me share with you that I understand unequivocally it is not about me. It is about us, the Asa family. It is about us as brothers and sisters and as a family. So let me change that. We are starting with the man in the mirror. And we are asking them to change their ways. And let me cut straight to the chase. My brothers and sisters, if we want the world to be a better place, if we hope for the world to be a more caring place, if it's our heart's desire that the world will be a more inclusive, senior servant friendly place. Then I need you to join me and let us take a look at ourselves and make that change. Thank you.